Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the session and thank you for joining us for our very first webinar of 2024. We're really glad to have you here. I'm Nikki Jovakik from Lookup Strata and also the Managing Director of Tower Body Corporate on the Gold Coast. Today, we're speaking with Alison Benson from Karen Benson Lawyers about the changes to New South Wales Strata and Community Title legislation, and they came into effect on the 11th of December 2023. What changed with the reforms? Alison's here to fill us in about committee election and removal, managing agency agreements, funds for emergency repairs, strata renewal, and there's much more as well. Now, before we begin, I'd like to mention that the information in the session, including the discussions arising from submitted questions and chat conversations, is not legal advice and should not be relied upon as legal advice, and you should seek independent advice before acting on the information contained in the session. Now, we're delighted to be joined again today by Alison Benson from Karen Benson Lawyers. Alison is a strata lawyer who has provided general strata advice, acted in strata disputes and worked with clients in preparing and enforcing bylaws and strata management statements since 2008. From 2012 onwards, Alison has acted exclusively on behalf of owners, corporations and lot owners in respect of both strata and community association disputes and building and construction disputes. Alison has extensive experience in commercial litigation and dispute resolution. Her knowledge across a variety of strata scheme matters enables her to advise owners, corporations, lot owners and other interested parties on a range of issues and to represent their interests both informally and before the courts. So welcome back, Alison. It's wonderful to have you back with us again today. Hi, Nikki. Hi, everyone. I'm seeing some familiar names pop up in the welcome chat or the webinar chat group. So hi to everybody. Um, so as uh, you can see, and I'll, I'll disclose to everybody right at the start, yeah, I have uh, I have no hair at the moment. Um, so uh, that is thanks to um, some or having a diagnosis of breast cancer. Uh, all is good as you can see. I'm just waiting for that hair to grow back, uh, and I'm willing to take bets on whether it's going to come back straight or curly, guys. Um, so please let me know what your thoughts are with that. Uh, but all good, and I'm absolutely delighted to start the new year in a much healthier and happier position. Um, and I think this is great to start it with a blast, doing what I absolutely love to do, which is educating people about strata schemes and community title schemes. So thank you so much for the invitation, Nikki. Um, it's great. Um, there is an awful lot to get through today. So we have a action-packed schedule. I will share a copy of my presentation with you very, very shortly. Um, but I won't be able to go through point by point on the presentation just because limitations of time. And when you actually dig into the changes, there's actually a fair few. If people say, oh, there were some very simple changes. And in fact, I think I do in this, this presentation. Just give them a slap on the wrists because although they're simple, there's a lot to go through. And the reason why I put the action packed um, presentation together is so that you have a resource that you can download later from the Lookup Strata website. And it's got all of the details and the sections there for you. So you don't have to frantically take notes during this session. Um, more than happy to answer questions um, as on, oh, as ever. So let me just share this screen for you. So this is the copy of the presentation or the title of the presentation. Uh, aim is to just give you an overview, basically, of the reforms. Uh, there's a typo there in the first line, so you can see how well I went uh, on holidays preparing this for you. Um, it is really quite dense, as I said before, because we're talking about four acts and corresponding regulations that had changes, and they are the Community Land Management Act, Community Land Development Act, as well as the Strata Schemes Management Act and the Strata Schemes Development Act. It's restricted, though, the, the reform legislation because it only responded to 31 of the 139 reform recommendations. Um, so although it's pretty dense, we've still got, what, 108 recommendations uh, that Parliament's going to have to consider and figure out what they're going to, to do with. OK, there's just some abbreviations that I'm going to be using throughout the presentation, the acts that we're going to be talking about. Um, I've grouped it all. And it's, it's a little bit arbitrary, the grouping, but I've tried to group the uh, the changes into headings. Uh, I just think that makes it easier for people. A lot of the changes were around committees. Uh, so there was this little gap in the legislation, um, quite frankly, for both the community lands uh, or community titles legislation and the strata schemes uh, legislation, 
which said that uh, strata committees had to be elected at AGMs. The issue used to be, well, what happened when you either had somebody that had to leave the strata committee or you voted and had a special resolution to oust the committee or a member of the committee? Technically, they couldn't then be elected. You had to have an, uh, a vacancy and people elected as a um, vacancy member effectively of the uh, the committee. This now allows you to have elections and you must elect at the general meetings, but you can also have another general meeting and elect permanent members of your committees. And there's the relevant acts there. There's been some changes around disclosure requirements and you'll see that when we go through the strata renewal provisions as well. Um, so the changes are effectively that um, you have to disclose direct and indirect pecuniary interests, and you may not participate in discussions or votings in relation to that interest. When we look at strata renewal committees, um, that is actually a stronger prohibition, but I'll take you to that in a, in a moment. The other uh, point here is that committee members can now be removed, so you can vote them out with an ordinary resolution rather than a special resolution. So, and if somebody is removed or if the entire committee is removed, the people that have been voted out um, under section 35 of the Strata Schemes Management Act and 38 of the Community Lands Development Act, well, they can't be committee members for another 12 months from the date that they were ousted. So it makes it easier to get rid of Strata committee members that the owner's corporation either doesn't think is doing a good job um, or may have interest or not be acting in the interest of the owner's corporation as a whole and for the benefit of all lot owners, which is what they're required to do. So easier to get rid of committee members. If you oust them, be careful because you can't then have them back as a committee member for 12 months. So what we had in some of the schemes that I was involved with was you would see across the course of the 12 months between AGMs is this constant ousting of one committee, then the tide would turn, another committee or that committee that came in would get ousted themselves and the old committee would come back. So this just removes all of that politicking, basically. basically. Um, the other really big change is that community associations, precinct associations, um, well, associations can now have up to 15 committee members. Previously, they could only have nine. And with the larger uh, community schemes that we're seeing, oftentimes there was well more than nine development lots. And it meant that those other development lots that didn't get appointed to the committee effectively had no voice um, at the committee level. Um, and it led to a lot of politicking. So now you can have up to 15. Um, it's a good change in that it allows more representation I think it's going to have to be well managed because having 15 committee members affects quorum. So you, you're going to have to have a lot more people turn up to get quorum. And it also affects just the running of meetings. It's, it's harder when you've got 15 people you're trying to get to agree to something and to agree to dates for committee meetings, for instance. Okay, there's changes in managing agents. You can probably see me getting all my troopers in a row. So this is getting our managing agents in a row. First change is that Managers have to now give um, notice of the expiry of their management agreement more than six months. Oh, sorry, not more than six months and not less than three months before it expires. So at least three months before it expires, you should have been given a notice. But you could get that notice six months or up to six months before it expires. And this is to cure an evil. What was actually happening was um, strata managers would get appointed uh, and oftentimes they would just immediately give notice of this is the date of expiry of our agreement. Um, and then, of course, three years or two years, three months or two years, uh, 11 months would pass, the agreement was up and they'd say, oh, well, we haven't got a notice. And the strata manager could point back to what they'd done two odd years ago and say, well, yes, you did. So obviously notices were being forgotten. This This just makes it... Um, or brings it to the attention at about the right time for schemes to go out and to look at other contracts and other potential managers just to see what the, the market's going to be like. Um, now, in respect of associations, um, there's now a restriction in the term of appointment of strata managers and facilities managers. Um, so in this scheme's initial period, you can't appoint uh, a strata manager or facility manager. 
um, past the first annual general meeting. Um, and not yet in effect, but this is going to be a huge change, I think. Um, and it's not yet in effect because NCAT needs time to get its forms ready uh, and to change its website. But the Commissioner for Fair Trading is going to be somebody that's eligible to uh, make an application to appoint a compulsory strata manager for both strata schemes and associations. So where you've got schemes that are so clearly dysfunctional, this is going to affect them, I think. Uh, I think what will happen is um, we may get NCAT members suggesting that the scheme is seriously dysfunctional uh, and then notifying the Commissioner for Fair Trading who could step in and make that application. So quite often people, although they're in a fight, the scheme is dysfunctional, they don't want to make an appointment or to apply for an appointment of a compulsory manager uh, because they want you know, their version um, of the manager to be uh, and their version of what's going to happen. They want to have the vote. But some schemes, it is just so clearly dysfunctional um, that it needs a compulsory manager. This is going to cure that. And it doesn't apply to many, many schemes at all, uh, but it's going to be really good for some of the schemes um, that I've seen uh, in our, our litigation. Okay, finances and, fin and fines is another area. And this all is all about transparency, basically, um, and the ability or trying to get schemes to be able to respond quickly or more quickly than what they used to. So the first big change is that contributions can now be raised uh, and they can be raised to be due and payable after 14 days notice. And that's for emergency repairs. So previously we had, you could raise a levy. So say you had storm damage, wasn't covered by insurance, um, you could have a general meeting, raise a special levy to cover it if you didn't have enough funds, but the levy had to be um, given 30 days notice to make it due and payable. Now it's halved effectively, so you can get that money in the door a lot quicker. Um, now there is a definition of emergency repairs, so you can't just say this is an emergency. Um, it is repairs to a building on the strata scheme or a building on association property that is necessary to mitigate serious and imminent threat to the health or safety of occupants. Um, slight concern in that it's tied to a building. Uh, so for instance, if you have a retaining wall uh, that falls down, uh, it could um, seriously or affect the health and safety of occupants or be an imminent threat. Uh, but if it's not part of a building that is in the strata scheme or a building on association property, um, then it can't be considered to be an emergency repair. So just be a bit careful when you're looking at what is and what isn't emergency repairs. Any contributions or levy contributions for any other purpose, 30 days notice is still required. And now schemes, this is going to sound a little bit funny, but think admin fund and capital works fund. So schemes except for two lot strata schemes that have used money from one fund. So say I take money out of the capital works fund um, to cover legal expenses. Um, it should have been paid from the administrative fund. Previously, uh, the money then had to be returned back to the fund that it was taken from. So you'd have to have the admin fund replenish the capital works fund. Now you can actually have a resolution, so a general meeting resolution, and the owners corporation can decide if it's going to reimburse all of the money part of the money or none of the money to the fund that should have or that the money was taken out of and that it was the incorrect fund to take it out of or whether it's just going to raise a contribution to repay the monies to the fund that it did take the money out of and that it shouldn't have taken the money out of. So there's a bit more flexibility there. Um, and you can see what happens. Sometimes you have um, works that need to be done, there's going to be an argument, is this a repair, is this capital works? Um, sometimes it will be, okay, we've got a huge amount of money in our capital works fund. Um, we had you know, a roof replaced under insurance. We now don't need to um, raise any more money for roof um, repairs because we've just got a brand new roof from insurance, uh, but we've got $50,000 sitting in there from our roof um, in the capital works fund. So, you know, that's been used for another purpose. Now you can decide as an owner's corporation, well, do we actually replenish the capital works fund? Part of it, some of it, none of it. 
um, or do we raise a, a special levy uh, to pay the money back to that fund? Gives you some more choice, basically. Um, the other, and this is going to be a bugbear for all of our strata managers, other change that's come on in is that two independent quotations for expenses over $30,000 must be obtained, except if it's for an emergency. That's going to be a bugger. I know that having to obtain um, various quotes for insurances has caused problems. Um, this one hopefully will be easier. Previously, only large schemes had to do it. If a scheme cannot obtain two independent quotes, um, and I know there's schemes out there that can't do this because oftentimes they can't get a single builder to come out and give them a quote. Um, but if you can't obtain two independent quotes, then it needs to be a standing agenda item on the general meeting. You have to note the, um, the expense that was incurred and why two independent quotes couldn't be provided. So more transparency for the owners, uh, but a little bit more work for strata managers, quite frankly. Animals. This is always going to be a big one. Um, one of the changes is not yet in effect, as you can see down the bottom, and that's in relation to community associations, um, which will very shortly have the same restrictions um, about uh, community associations. And by that, I mean precinct and neighbourhood associations as well. Um, they will no longer be able to unreasonably refuse uh, keeping animals in lots in the scheme not yet in effect so we're waiting for that proclamation date of that other changes that have come in is schemes are prevented from requiring fees bonds or insurance as a condition of keeping an animal now i think a lot of us would have seen um, cases that allowed um, and actually said well you can have the keeping uh, of an animal on the proviso that you pay the application fee uh, or that you know a bond be uh, prepared or prepared and kept. Um, one case actually said that I think it was a three hundred dollar administration fee was reasonable and allowed that um, bylaw. That was an NCAT decision. Um, now that is all out the window. You cannot require an application fee, a bond, or insurance as a part of uh, or as a reason why an animal can't be kept and as a part of the application process for keeping an animal. Okay, and that applies to both communities. Uh, and strata titles. Schemes are also prevented from imposing an unreasonable burden on people using an assistance animal on the common property or the association property. This is a great one. It limits the evidence required of an occupant uh, that has an assistance animal. So two of the evils that were coming up there um, were very, very common. Um, you can have an animal, but as a condition of keeping your animal, you must um, carry your animal when walking across the common property. That was a really common one. Um, you can't have that anymore. Um, the example given, uh, and it's quite a, a good example, is uh, if you are a blind person with an assistance animal and there is a bylaw that says you must carry your animal when on the common property, that imposes an unreasonable burden because obviously the blind person or the visually impaired person cannot use their assistance animal in the manner that they need to use their assistance animal. So that um, is one restriction. People or schemes need to start looking at their bylaws to make sure it's not going to come a cropper on that point. Uh, and the second evil was um, you can't require um, evidence as to health, um, for instance, you can only require evidence of the animal's accreditation under the Disability Discrimination Act or a statutory declaration verifying that the animal has received that training under that act. Um, there may be regulations in the future, but there aren't at the moment that set out what further evidence can be required. But you can't, for instance, say, um, well, tell me why you have to keep an assistance animal uh, and then require health records. And I know some schemes were doing this. Um, so which was obviously stressful for the people that did need an assistance animal to have to disclose to people um, what their particular health conditions were. So limitation on the evidence, limitation on unreasonable burdens on people using assistance animals uh, and restrictions on requiring fees, bonds and insurance as a condition of keeping animals in the scheme. So making it much, much easier for people to keep their animals. Uh, our next topic is records. Bit dry, but it's going to be important. 
um, there's very, um, well, very much a push is what I'll say to get the records to be held electronically. Um, there is a six month uh, transitional period. So it takes us up to the uh, 10th of May, 2024, uh, if my maths is correct, um, that from the 10th of May, schemes have to keep their records electronically. Before that date, you aren't required to um, reproduce your records and then make them electronic. But for strata managers out there, if you're not doing it, I would just start personally getting into the process of making sure all your um, records are able to be reproduced electronically um, because 10 May is going to come up before we know it. So prior to 10 May, people want to do an inspection of the books and records. They can still be going through, you know, the old um, archive boxes that we've all got sitting around from 10th of May. Any strata scheme records from that date have to be electronic. So we're going to have a mix for a very, very long time um, while schemes eventually will have, well, I suppose the, the existing schemes will never have all of their records uh, electronically, but the new schemes definitely will. Uh, and, you know, schemes or boxes, I should say, that uh, are full of records from 20 years ago may or may not still be relevant, um, should be still kept in my opinion, uh, but I know oftentimes uh, they aren't kept um, from 20 odd years ago. Uh, another change is, uh, and this goes to um, the requirement to provide um, notice where the lot's been leased, um, the relevant person is the change. Now must tell the um, owner's corporation or association that the lot has been leased and provide notice of the tenants. Now the relevant person used to be the lessor or the, the owner. Um, now it can be their real estate agent as well. Um, a further change is that if the real estate agent doesn't, they or the lot owner can be fined for non-compliance. And if there is no notice of the tenant given by either the landlord or the real estate agent, tenants can provide notice. Um, they also have to be provided with notice of both the registered bylaws and also all applicable management statements. So stratus management statements, for instance, you need to provide them. Previously, you only had to provide the, the registered bylaws uh, in the strata schemes that weren't part of a community title. Um, so a little bit more burden on strata managers. Um, I can hear the groans starting already. Um, there's also some changes as to how notices can be served. Um, it, basically, it's you can serve documents to a nominated address or location um, by electronic transmission to that nominated address or location. This is going to be, uh, I mean, it, it, it's the act that's keeping up with the, the times, I suppose. Um, I can start seeing that people will say, okay, well, um, here is my address for service. Um, upload everything to my Dropbox. Here's the location of my Dropbox. Or, um, you know, my address for service is going to be I don't know, via whatever software provider um, that is managing all of my, my lots. Um, and, you know, you might have to uh, either um, do the normal um, service provisions, so send it to an email address if an email is provided. Um, if no email is provided and they don't seem to be um, able to be served um, at their address, their, their Australian address for service, so, for instance, letters keep on getting returned to sender. Uh, and when you send a process server and they knock on the door, uh, the person says, I'm not that person. They haven't lived here for X number of years. Well, then we've now got a choice to be able to upload documents to a particular location or electronically transmit them to a location if we've been given notice of a location by a lot owner. Just a bit more flexibility. Another um, I suppose, field that is going to have to be put onto our strata management records uh, and updated from time to time, but it gives us a little bit more choice. This is a bit of a busy slide. Um, again, this is actually really going to kick in um, and start affecting us and should be careful about any meetings or annual general meetings uh, that you have had um, since the 11th of um, December uh, or will be making room for uh, in your calendars, uh, because you now have to give 14 clear days notice of annual general meetings for both strata and community associations. Um, oh, sorry, 
I should say, I'll take that back for strata schemes and neighbourhood associations. Um, community associations and precinct associations, your notice periods for your AGMs remain the same. Um, meeting notices must also include calls for committee nominations. Quite frankly, I think that change wasn't necessarily needed in the, uh, the Act because they all did it anyway. Um, but that's that's another change. Big thing is 14 clear days notice for owners, corporations, and neighbourhood associations. There's a change in how special resolutions are calculated um, in relation to two-lot strata schemes. Um, so just be careful if you've got a two-lotter. Um, it affects the ability um, to basically elect officers um, and to elect strata committee members. Um, what the change is, is effectively, if it's a two-lot scheme, the original owner's vote is not reduced by two-thirds. Um, for all other schemes, if the, the original owner owns more than 50% of lots in the scheme or 50% of the aggregate unit entitlement of lots in the scheme, uh, then their voting entitlements are reduced for the purposes of a special resolution. Um, but two lot schemes are now differentiated. Um, there are also new restrictions that apply to the voting rights of company nominees and powers of people voting under powers of attorney. Just be really careful with this. It looks like it's the same as the proxy limits. So 20 lots or less, um, the company nominee or the attorney can exercise voting rights on behalf of one owner uh, or where there's more than 20 lots, uh, the attorney or the company nominee can exercise voting rights on behalf of not more than 5% of the total number of lot owners. It differs slightly to the proxy um, requirements because it, the proxy requirements talk about votes. Um, this provision talks about holding votes on behalf of other owners. Um, so this can foreseeably allow you to hold more votes under a power of attorney or a company nominee because an owner may own more than one lot. Um, so just read that very, very carefully when you're calculating um, voting rights. Uh, time for original owners to provide key information has also been increased. Now needs to be provided 14 days prior to the first AGM. Um, or for associations, if there has been no first AGM, within three years of the schemes being registered, whichever one's the sooner for associations. Um, and the purpose behind that was to allow lot owners more time um, to review the original documents from the developer. So, and things like that would be initial maintenance schedules, for instance, um, plans, specifications. Not sure that people actually will uh, and that they, you know, the extra time will make them do that. Uh, but now for the people who are inclined to review that information, they've now got an additional 12 days. Bylaws and two-lot schemes. I told you about one of the changes, which is the change to the um, calculation of special resolution votes. Uh, but there's two other changes, um, which are that strata bylaws, uh, sorry, um, sorry, which are that uh, two-lot schemes do not require a notice to comply with a bylaw to be authorised by a resolution of the owners corporation or the strata committee. This prevents the lot owner that's having problems uh, being blocked by the lot owner that they allege is causing the problems. So a lot owner um, can basically uh, require the owner's corporation to issue a notice to comply in a two-lot scheme, doesn't have to get strata committee approval, does not have to get owner's corporation approval. Um, I would suggest if you were a strata manager uh, and a owner in a two-lot scheme requests you to do that, just be very careful and make sure that you've got evidence uh, and that the decision is documented and that the, the requirement uh, to do so uh, from that lot owner is really well documented. Um, just to cover your own bot bots, basically, make sure that there's a paper trail of the decision being made. Um, another big change and it's a bit of a technical change here, but it was needed, is that previously we couldn't just register a consolidation of the bylaws. Um, now we can, as long as there's been a special resolution to consolidate the bylaws and to register the consolidation. And that's why some schemes, although it was a requirement to consolidate the bylaws, we couldn't get the consolidations registered because LRS wouldn't, wouldn't accept them. Now they will, uh, as long as there's been a special resolution uh, to consolidate the bylaws and to register the consolidation. 
Um, there's a bit of clarification that the written consent of an owner with a common property rights bylaw does, is not required to give their consent. Oh, sorry, sorry, I'll take that back. An owner with a common property rights bylaw is not required to give written consent to a change of their bylaw or of the bylaws unless their particular bylaw that gives them their common property rights is being changed. Um, so that's good. You don't have to necessarily run around if you're going to consolidate the bylaws and get common property rights bylaw uh, recipients uh, is what I'm going to use. You don't have to go and get their consent. Um, and it's also been made very, very clear in the transitional provisions uh, that although a scheme's registered bylaws can continue in force, they are not going to be valid if they contra contravene the Strata Schemes Management Act. So I think we've all seen uh, bylaws out there that um, contain uh, prohibitions, complete prohibitions on animals. They're still out there and about there. Uh, there will now be bylaws out there that have uh, burdens uh, on keeping animals in schemes that could be unreasonable burdens um, when they're applied to assistance animals. There will be bylaws out there that require bonds, that require applications or insurances. Well, they are not going to be valid because they now contravene the Strata Schemes Management Act. And I should also say the Community Lands Management Act because the same change has been made in the Community Lands Management Act. Um, now, let's move forward. And we're going at a rate of knots on this one. Again, this is a really busy slide. I encourage you all, if you are looking at a strata renewal process, download a copy of this presentation and go through it in depth, particularly with this slide. There's a lot of changes that have been made in relation to disclosures. Um, and the whole aim is making sure that um, there is more transparency and to cure some of the evils that were, were happening. Um, so, for instance, I think it, it's pretty well known that um, one of the cases that went up to the Land and Environment Court uh, in relation to a strata renewal um, involved a objectors or an objector that was actually a prospective developer or a um, a competing developer, uh, and they were a lot owner. They would bought a lot in the plan, and they were trying to block the proposed strata renewal process um, using their ability as an objector to lodge or as a lot owner to object. They also had the benefit of um, the previous uh, version of the Strata Schemes um, Development Act, which said effectively that owners' corporations would be responsible for the reasonable legal fees of objectors. Um, so they kind of got a free hit to object. Um, arguably, they were not acting uh, in the best or in good faith because they had their own commercial interests at heart in blocking another competing developer trying to do a strata renewal. Um, so what's actually happened is relevant interests is now or has been a term that's been defined and it includes interests of lot owners with prospective developers as well as the potential developers. And I'm going to use those words very, very um, carefully. So proposed developer or prospective developer is the developer that's actually put forward the strata renewal proposal, whether it's a collective sale or a redevelopment. Um, and I'll use that in terms of proposed developer, prospective developer, proposed developer, or sorry, proposed purchaser or proposed prospective purchaser. A, a prospective developer or purchaser is a competing developer or a competing purchaser. So somebody that's a lot owner and they want at some stage um, to try and do the same thing, to do a strata renewal. Uh, they haven't put forward a strata renewal plan. Um, so if a lot owner has an interest as either a the proposed developer or purchaser, so an entity or a relationship with that entity, so think uh, you're a shareholder, you are a company director and employee of a proposed developer or purchaser, you've got to disclose it. That was under the previous Act. But now you also have to disclose um, if you have interests in a prospective developer or purchaser. So it, it then has to be known, or, or the disclosure has to be given to the owner's corporation. Um, it has to be noted on the records. Um, if you are trying to get elected to the Strata Renewal Committee, it has to be made before um, the elections, and it's a continuous requirement to disclose. 
okay? The key uh, part of this is, unlike with the strata committees who do have to disclose interests and may um, be able to then vote on a matter that's in relation to their interests, a strata renewal committee, if somebody has a relevant interest, well, then that person is automatically restricted from being present during discussions or votes in relation to that interest. So it, it wipes out their voting rights effectively in relation to that interest. They can't even be present during discussions. Um, and that's to try to stop um, some of the um, you know, proposed um, or prospective developers and purchasers, I should say, um, buying blocks or buying lots in schemes uh, and then trying to block their competitors' strata renewal process. Um, that's solely what it's aimed at. Now, another um, key change is an acknowledgement effectively that strata renewal takes time. So strata committee or strata renewal committees have now been extended out to two years. There is some more disclosure requirements along the strata, many, a strata renewal process and lot owners, not just strata renewal committee um, members, but lot owners have to disclose their relevant interests at certain key points during the process. Um, the Land and Environment Court has also been given um, more leeway, if you like. If there's been a procedural irregularity, um, so you haven't crossed your T, uh, provided it hasn't caused substantial injustice and it won't cause substantial injustice, that's not going to um, cause the strata renewal plan to be thrown out uh, and the, the application to be thrown out. Um, and the court has now been given some costs orders against or the ability to make costs orders against objectors. Um, so there's some fairly wide ranging changes there. Um, they are technical changes as well. So very, very technical part of the legislation, the strata renewal process. So always, always, always check, double check the act. Um, the only change, um, other change I wanted to, to, to talk about quickly is with terminations of strata schemes uh, and community schemes. Um, this is where it's done unanimously by all lot owners. Um, you know, make an application to the Registrar General. Um, interestingly now, the Registrar General uh, is being considered to be, you know, maybe hip, uh, but definitely more um, in line with the electronic nature of society. And previously you had to um, publish a notice that you were going to apply to terminate the scheme. Uh, now you do still need to make sure that there is some notification, but it doesn't necessarily have to be publishing a notice in a paper. Um, I don't know too many people that actually buy uh, physical papers anymore. Uh, and apparently neither does Parliament because now it just has to be notified in a manner that the Register General considers appropriate to ensure it comes to the attention of people, uh, of the public, not less than 14 days before and not more than six months before the application to terminate is made. Um, so we're, we're gradually updating our legislation to take into the fact that we're becoming more of an electronic society. Uh, stop our share now. As I said, this presentation will be available um, on the Lookup Strata website. But I'm going to stop the share and go to some of your questions, guys. Um, there's been a couple that have come through um, before. Um, one of them was under uh, Section 238, Orders Relating to a Strata Committee. Um, the comment is that the, the ability to get an order uh, to kick a Strata Committee uh, member off uh, has existed for a long time, uh, but the person couldn't locate a single case from NCAT where a strata committee had been removed from their position. Um, I've run these cases. I I probably would have um, decisions, but the decisions haven't been published. Um, not all decisions of NCAT are published, um, only ones that the um, president feels are important um, get published. So they, there will be cases out there, but they may or may not be published. Um, I don't know of a published one, actually. Uh, and in a lot of cases, quite frankly, um, the people that are in the process of um, a case to oust them um, oftentimes resign uh, under the weight because they just don't want to defend um, the application. So a lot of times these ones settle as well. Can we remove inactive members from the committee? Well, yes, you can if you pass an ordinary resolution to remove them. Just be wary that you can't put them back on the committee for 12 months. Um, so even if they say, I'm going to be a good person and I'm going to you know, be a good strata committee member and I'm going to turn up to every meeting, if you boot them off 
um, then you can't get them back in for 12 months. Uh, can the Strata Committee action the spending of money to renovate the common area without the voting of other owners who are not on the committee? And if so, how? Um, well, renovate is different to repair. Repair, an owner's corporation has the obligation to do that. Um, it's just a normal resolution unless the committee is restricted in terms of the decisions it can make, in terms of money or the types of decisions, then the strata committee could authorise any repair. Um, can it renovate? The question is, is it a repair or renovation? If it's an alteration or addition to the common property, that's going to require a special resolution. And that's something that the strata committee can't then action unless that um, alteration or addition has been approved by a special resolution of the owners corp at a general meeting. Uh, the next question I think I've answered is, is the limit a cost spending thing or just that it's a minor cosmetic renovation and not a structural change? Um, well, if it's an addition or alteration to the common property, um, again, you're going to have to get a special resolution. And that's the, the whole case of, of Thu coming back to, to bite us. Um, and Thu says basically it's got to be the same functional equivalency. Um, so you can't put a chandelier in when you had a single light bulb, basically. Uh, next question is, our strata is within a community estate which adjoins a national park. The development consent for the estate specifies detailed conditions for the keeping of dogs and prohibits cats. In addition, over half the properties in the strata are leased to the hotel for tourist accommodation and the hotel does not accept bookings with animals. What are the implications for us with the changes to the legislation? A few things. Um, I actually act for a couple of schemes that... Um, have restrictions on their title um, and it's part of the development consent and they're actually restrictions on title rather than just restrictions um, in the community lands uh, management statement. Um, so you need to see is there a restriction of use on title? Um, oftentimes there will be and it'll be registered on the title of all the lots um, and that will override any um, strata management statement uh, or any um, management statement. So check that. The Act, if there's, there's no such restriction, um, you are going to have to um, check uh, your development consent, see if it's going to require a change of use. Um, there is a provision in most local environmental plans and it's Clause 1.9a, um, and I just refer to it as the bylaw buster. Um, why? Because it effectively says if there is a development consent um, that allows, you know, I don't know, X, Y, Z, so use as a tourist hotel, um, and there's any other um, restriction by way of an agreement or by way of, for instance, a management statement that says you can't use a property as a tourist hotel, um, then the, by the development consent trumps the management statement or the agreement. Um, so you're going to have to need to, to look at that. Um, so there are going to be implications for you. I suspect with your particular scheme, you need to get a lawyer to look into that, look into the, the what's been registered on title, because it's not going to be a simple one, quite frankly. Um, there's a few different acts you need to look at. Uh, why has the legislation made it, made it easier to remove a committee member? Who does this help? I think I've probably answered that a little way. Um, it helps in schemes that are highly political, basically. You could get a voting block of, um, you know, 26 people or 26 unit entitlements and they'd block any special resolution. Uh, and you get active strata committee members going and getting proxies and preventing themselves from being thrown off. Um, so that's, that's what it helps. It just, it makes it less of a restriction to be able to get re remove people um, but it still has to be the majority of people do not want to, that committee member on the committee. So we're not getting rid of a majority rights. We're just getting rid of sort of a special majority, if you like, or a special resolution. Um, good point here, removing a lazy committee member. Um, I've, I've jumped in, Alison, too, and tried to keep a, a record of what's been um, put up in lazy. chat. So, yeah, so I might just, and, and on the back of that question about the legislation and um, removing committee members, we were also asked, how does that affect a committee member on multiple strata committees? Uh, so it, it only applies to the owners' corporation or the association that you're actually on. Um, sometimes you will have um, committee members for a strata scheme that's part of a community association 
They might be so the strata committee uh, for the associate for the owners corp. If they get voted off as a strata committee member by the owners corp, well then they're out. But they might also have been nominated as a representative for their owners corporation to sit on the association committee. Well, the association would have to vote them out as well to get them out of that second position. Okay. Uh, would a building manager and their family be considered to have a conflict of interest in many matters? Ours is an executive committee member and lobbies and votes to reduce his work and increase his revenue. Yeah, if, if that was my um, owner's corporation and my strata committee, um, I'd be a bit upset if they had disclosed, you know, I'm the building manager and they have to disclose it and it has to be noted on the record. Um, the strata committee then gets to decide um, whether the building manager should be party to discussions about anything in relation to their interest and party to the voting and able to vote. Um, so if my strata committee said, oh, look, we don't care, the building manager can vote uh, and they can hear all our discussions and then the building manager gets to vote and it swings the vote in their favour, I wouldn't be particularly happy. Um, so I think that's that's something you need to look at when you're voting for strata committee members. Um, as a lot owner, if they are a lot owner, well, then they're always going to be entitled to vote. Um, in strata renewal, uh, well, actually, it wouldn't affect the building manager in strata renewals um, because they're not a proposed or prospective um, developer. Okay, wonderful. And then the upcoming changes to do with the compulsory manager, I think you mentioned they haven't quite yeah. come in as yet. Um, and there are a lot of questions about um, that at that time. And in this circumstance, um, is it when it hasn't actually been requested by the lot owner or committee yeah. member, it's just... Uh, the, the, the Commissioner for Fair Trading can do it on their own bat, um, mm. so it does not have to be requested. I, the, there will have to be a trigger, though, because the Commissioner for Fair Trading does not, and their staff do not have enough time to be monitoring NCAT cases and, and strata schemes and going, oh, this one deserves it or needs it. Um, deserves is probably the wrong word. So they're not going to actively monitor for this. Um, but if, you know, they have a significant number of lot owners lobbying them and saying, you know, we are three out of 10 lot owners in this scheme. We don't have the voting rights to, to do much. And this is what's happening. Please, 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 could you make an application? Um, or could you step into this application um, because we think it's it's required? Um, that's when it's going to attract the Commissioner for Fair Trading's notice. So don't don't just think it's going to be a magic wand and they'll just step in and automatically do it. They'll have to have notice somehow that there's there are issues in a particular scheme, and then they're going to have to form the opinion that it's necessary. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Um, and with the reimbursement of money from the correct fund that you mentioned, is that could that be retrospective? So if it's something that's happened before the 10th of December 2023 with re regards to funds being taken from the wrong account, uh, is the new uh, legislation retrospective for those instances? That's a really good question. I'd have to have a look at the transitional provisions. Um, my gut feel is no, it's not going to be. Um, why? Because unless it specifically says that it's um, retrospective, um, the um, general um, rule is that legislation isn't retrospective. And I cannot recall seeing anything in that particular provision um, where the change was that says this applies retrospectively. Um, yeah, I haven't, I'd have to go through the transitional provisions. Um, I My gut feel is no. Um, it's not going to apply. Um, for schemes that have only just moved money or paid expenses from an incorrect fund, is what I'm going to say, um, that have done it within the last three months, well, the requirement used to be that you had to repay it to the correct fund within three months. If you were still in that three-month window, I think the legislation would very fairly allow you to pass a resolution to say, no, we're not going to do it. But past that three months, um, or so more than three months, um, back, I don't think it's going to apply, but I'd, I'd have to double, triple check the legislation on that one. Okay, thank you. I ask for clarification with regards to the 15 committee members for associations. Does that also apply to strata committees? No, no, no. It's only for associations. Okay, wonderful. Uh, I thought this was a good one. Are all these changes incorporated in the updated version of the Strata Scheme Management Act 2015 or is it a separate document? And if so, can we provide access to the document? Yeah, so it's have a, be very, very careful. I love using Austly. Um, so Austly is A-U-S-T-L-I-I. -I. 
Um, I love using that because it's got a, a note up function so you can see cases about particular sections. Ostly hasn't updated the Strata Schemes Management Act yet. So don't be using that to look at these sections. It's just lagging a little bit, but it's a voluntary organisation. So it doesn't, it only gets funding from um, grants and, and um, donations. So don't, don't hate on Ostly. Just give them three months to catch up. Look at legislation.nsw.gov.au. Um, and the Strata Schemes Management Act, Development Act, Community Lands Management and Development Act, they've all been updated, as have the regulations. Um, if you want to go and see one document with all of the changes in it, uh, then it is the, well, this is actually the bill, um, but if you substitute the word bill for, for act, um, there is a document that's sitting on the uh, legislation.nsw.gov.au website called the Strata Legislation Amendment Act 2023. Yeah, look, it's it's much, much easier, I have to admit, to go and just have a look at the acts. If you go on to Legislation um, New South Wales website, which is a parliamentary um, website that contains all the legislation, you can actually do a point in time search as well. So you can look at the different versions of the act. So that's a really easy way to like have a look at a particular section and then jump back to the 10th of December before the changes. But otherwise, go into the Strata Legislation Amendment Act. Uh, you will see things there like, and I'm literally just reading, uh, change section 32, paragraph 1C, omit the words to act, which doesn't tell you a hell of a lot until you actually go to the act and have a look. So you're going to have to, even if you download the Act, you'll have to then jump on and look at the Act itself to interpret the amending Act. So if, if it was me uh, and I didn't have to do it for a reason because, you know, I'm a bit of a nerd lawyer, um, I'd probably just look at the Act under the, the Legislation New South Wales website and then have a look at the point in time versions because it's easier. Okay, um, wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. And one of the things I'd really like to ask you before we go, we have a lot of questions about charging for pet approvals for applications, saying if we had to um, hold a meeting um, or we had to do any extra work for that, is there any way that we could charge for any get around that we could charge for the work that's uh, that's needed? That's going to be really, really, really difficult. I'm actually looking for the exact section uh, here. Uh, and the exact section says, um, this is in relation to an association, but it's the same for owner's corps. Um, an association must not require an owner or occupier of a lot in the scheme to A, pay a bond or fee relating to the keeping of an animal on the lot or B, obtain insurance for an animal kept on the lot. Now, the fee relating to the keeping of the animal on the lot um, is going to be the issue here. Is this a fee for keeping an animal on the lot if you're charging to hold a general meeting to approve keeping an animal on the lot? Hmm, potentially. I, I think I'd come down the lines of no, that's not a fee relating to the keeping of an animal, um, but that's going to be up for interpretation. That's not... Um, that that's something that's going to be fought over. Um, yeah, I and to be fair, you actually don't have to, um, as an association or an owner's corporation, it doesn't have to be the decision of um, at a general meeting. It could be a decision of the strata committee. So there's ways to, you know, make it less burdensome for people. Hold a paper meeting, for instance. Um, send notices out electronically. Um, you know, if this is is this is this motion to keep an animal a permission to keep an animal, um, is it the only motion on the agenda? Um, unlikely, or only substantive motion on the agenda? Unlikely. Um, so I, I suspect you're going to be stumped and you can't pay or can't get an owner to pay for the cost of a general meeting. Why general meeting's not required? Um, you can have a strata committee meeting at much much lower cost um, and burden to the owners' corporation. Thank you for your time today. As always, um, it's just uh, fantastic to to hear you present. You present so well, and it make make everything so clear for all of our um, <laughs> viewers. And I'm sure they feel the same way as well. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. If you gained value from this video, please hit like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you're looking for information about parking, strata insurance 
defects and more, head over to lookupstrata.com.au or sign up to our free weekly newsletter via the link in the description box below.